Well, good afternoon and welcome back to the virtual NZEUC afternoon sessions. I hope you've enjoyed the virtual NZEUC so far. And for those that are joining us for the first time for this session, welcome. This is the field operations session. My name is Jithin Singh. I lead our central government portfolio and I'm joined today by my colleague, Ed Cook from our tech solutions team in running the session. I wanna start by acknowledging and thanking our session sponsor, National Map, whom you'll hear from very soon. We have an exciting and packed agenda for this afternoon that will walk you through how Esri users are taking the power of location anywhere and being able to optimize efficiency in field activities with the power of Esri location intelligence. So let's have a look at the agenda for this afternoon. We'll start with a brief update from Ed covering ArcGIS field operations. What is it? How can you use the power of location to improve coordination and operational efficiency in the field, in field workforce activities? How can you reduce or even replace res reliance on paper and ensure both field workers and office staff use the same authoritative data to reduce errors, boost productivity, save money, and more? We'll then hand over to the team at National Map to give us a bit of an update. Who is National Map? What do they have to offer? And how are ISRI users making use of National Map today? And then the focus turns to our users, you. We have a great lineup of, of user stories interwound with customer spotlights, quick, sharp updates from our customers. We'll then finish with a bit of a wrap up and talk a little bit about what's next. And we'll look to answer some questions, hopefully if we have some time um, to finish. Now, some of you are probably wondering, how do we ask questions as part of these virtual sessions? Well, within the NZEUC platform, down the bottom left-hand corner, you will see an ask button. Clicking on this will pop up and ask a question panel. Select our session, in this case, field operations, and post your question. We do have someone monitoring questions and we will aim to address these during the Q&A at the end. Now, we might not have time to answer all of your questions, but please be assured that all questions asked will receive a response as we will do a post follow-up along with the recordings, which will be made available, I understand, tomorrow. So I do encourage you, please ask as many questions as possible. We will also include our details if you, if you do want to reach out and, um, and continue the conversation. So let's start with asking the question around how you digitally transform your field operations. Through the session, you will hear from our user stories and customer spotlights we're going to cover some key areas at a high level. How do you adopt modern workflows, eliminate or reduce your reliance on paper processes? How do you boost data accuracy, obtain accurate, liable and accessible data? How do you save time and money, optimize efficiency in field focused activities? How do you gain location, a location perspective, allocate resources to deliver the maximum impact? And how do you monitor all of that in real time using visually rich dashboards to inform decisions? So I want to start by looking at an update of ArcGIS field operations. And to assist me with this, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Ed. Over to you, Ed. Cool. Thanks for that, Jay. So when we think about ArcGIS and what it does for field work, um, we like to use the term ArcGIS field operations. And the reason why we do this is it's not just a standalone app. It's not just a standalone workflow. It's actually trying to connect your corporate GIS with the capabilities that native apps on mobile devices provide. Um, Esri's take on this is um, it's summed up in this mission statement quite well. Um, to digitally enable mobile workflows with location intelligence, so fieldwork can be completed faster, more efficiently, with better return on investment. So that really does sum up, I think, quite well what the approach is. So how is it done? We like to talk about fieldwork as happening in a number of phases, but all happening around a single um, source of truth. So we start off with planning our operations. Um, planning comes from using location to plan and assign field activities. You know, navigate, being able to eff efficiently and effectively get to your place of work in order to then start doing what we would regard as traditional um, field app activities like capturing data. But even before that step of going in and capturing information, being actually able to understand your, your environment with all the information that GIS and all the, all the different data sources out there that GIS shows. You know, now we can have maps out in the field that allow enhanced situational awareness, if you like, for our field teams before they get into the core bit of work we're interested in, which is capturing. And so capturing across the platform, 
is quite varied as you'll soon see. Uh, but really the crux of it is, is to perform data collection and send it back to the office from anywhere, whether you're online or offline. And then all that information coming in needs to go somewhere. And traditionally it's been stored in a database, but the applications that allow you to then monitor that information as it comes in are quite key. You know, knowing where your workers are and seeing the progress of the work that they're capturing in their real time is something this platform enables. And when it comes to identifying what people are up to, we then have the added thing of coordinating activities, being able to reflex task, if you like. We can see that there's a job that can be done. Being able to reassign someone onto that job while they're out there is something our platform can enable, which is you know, fantastic in terms of an efficiency perspective, being able to use the smarts of location to assign tasks that would have otherwise been done on separate days, but in the same day. So just be thinking about those different phases of field work and how ArcGIS field operation supports them. Because for us, we use a wealth of apps to support this core workflow of field operations. Um, Workforce is our planning tool. Um, ArcGIS Navigator is our navigation aid. We can understand with things like ArcGIS Explorer, being able to see the web maps and desktop maps that traditionally were printed out in our pocket on our device. Being able to capture with a wealth of different applications currently, we've got Collector, Survey123 and Quick Capture, you know, all allowing us to capture point line and polygon information with attributes behind it. Using tools like Tracker and ArcGIS dashboards, we're able to get that real time feed of how people are faring out there in the field and what's the level of work that they've completed while they've been out there. And then finally, coordinating with tools such as Workforce once again and Tracker and Explorer, all creating the cycle of field work and we find that a lot of organisations don't implement all of these applications, but instead they develop these really core workflows that revolve around maybe one, two or three applications. So we call this enhancing workflows by pairing apps, because one app can't do everything. So really it's that, that workflow, how do you chain it together? I'd like you to um, draw your attention to the top left of the slide, collecting and monitoring information. Now that's a, a simple workflow where you're using Survey123 and Collector out in the field, but all the information that's being captured is then being consumed back in a dashboard. So being able to have that connection between the field and the office and what's being conducted out there. Another one is maps and forms. Um, having map-based capture done by Collector and then form-based um, work conducted using Survey123. Because sometimes you need a form to fill out and other times it's just updating say a geometry or a location of something on a map. We then have the back and forth of forms and maps, being able to launch say inspection surveys from known locations and auto populating those forms with information that's already captured somewhere else. And that saves heaps of time in terms of not having to fill out asset IDs every time you visit something, you know, having that auto populated from your device natively. We then get into more sophisticated um, workflows um, the workforce launch pad is, is one that we see a lot of times with people who have to do multiple jobs, but they would just want one app to start with. So when they start their day being able to go into workforce as an application where they receive their spatial to-do list, and then based on what the job entails, launching either Survey123, Navigator or Collector, they can then carry on with their work and do the specific task that they need to, whether it's navigating to a job, capturing an inspection form for their, their workplace, or whether it's capturing a new asset location on site. Down on the bottom right, um, the prepare field workflow is all about how do we bring the desktop um, into this. Desktop is, is a tool that really is a cornerstone of a lot of foundation workflows across um, the geospatial platform. It's not just for field work, but with field work in particular, it can leverage our corporate data and information and publish it either into collector maps or explorer maps and allow us to have that same source of truth really in the field. It's, it's that classic, can I have my desktop GIS editing ability out with me wherever I am. The interesting trend that we've seen in the last few years, and finally, um, out of all these workflows, is that third party integration, integration piece. And here, this is all about, you can't just be watching a GDB waiting for edits to come through. You can't just be watching a dashboard all the time. How can we be smarter about it than when a specific feature is captured, we can be alerted from it using our own BAU um, corporate systems, whether that's email, our phone, or maybe, you know, it's our, our SharePoint sites. How do we get alerted of specific things of interest 
rather than having to sit and wait for it to be told um, to us by someone watching the FGDB or a dashboard. And so that's where we things, see things like Integromat and Microsoft Flow now called Microsoft Power Apps, I believe. It keeps changing its name, but you know, that same concept of every time a feature is added, it then spurring a, triggering a set of actions that then end up in, as say, an email alert on the other side of it. So really thinking about how we can be plugging in what we're doing in the field apps with our other corporate IT systems without needing that heavyweight integration at times. So all of these workflows are contributing to various different um, applications of the tools that we see out there. Um, a lot of you joining on the calls are already using our tools, which is fantastic. And hopefully a lot of you will be inspired by what we have for you today um, to go out and start using them more. But really you're part of a, a bigger movement of people who are really getting smarter with their field work and capturing higher, more accurate data faster and quicker to really guide their workflows. So that's just an overview of ArcGIS field operations. I'm now gonna pass you back to Jay, um, who will introduce our first presenter. Back to you, Jay. Awesome, thanks, Ed. That's a great high level look into what makes up ArcGIS field operations. As you saw in Ed's slides, ArcGIS field operations covers, cover, covers several phases of field work with Esri apps and technology designed for each phase. Keep these in mind as we walk through our sponsor, our user stories, as well as our customer spotlights that will be coming up. You will see examples of how each of these phases and how each app and technology is being applied. So our first presentation this afternoon is from our session sponsor, National Map. National Map is a New Zealand data provider that are working with Esri customers on innovative solutions. They're joining us here today to talk a little bit about their capability and, and using national map data in tools like ArcGIS Navigator. As the name suggests, ArcGIS Navigator falls into the navigate phase, allowing you to route to your work using your own roads, your own geospatial data, even if you're off, off, offline. So let's hear from Scott Kennedy from national map. So here we go. We're gonna have a crack at doing this by video. Many of you won't know me from Embarra Soap. I'm Scott Kennedy, Head of Growth for... Yeah, I know, another Scott. So I thought I'd clarify for you that I'm the Scott that's not a Scott. I don't have a sexy accent. I don't have people wonder what's under my kilt. And I don't have any major food labels named after me. In fact, my family name is so boring that people have written songs about how glad they are they're not me. Also, if there are any loud bangs during this presentation, I'll be the one hiding underneath my desk. So now that's cleared up, I thought I'd start with telling you a little bit about National Map and in line with uh, what we just talked about around my family name, I thought I'd start with what we're not. First of all, we're not owned by large private equity investors outside of New Zealand. We're 100% New Zealand owned, we employ Kiwis who work in New Zealand, and we pay taxes on all profits made in New Zealand. But most importantly, I think, we have a sole focus on providing transport data and solutions to improve productivity here in New Zealand, and have been doing so continuously for almost 30 years. There'll be many of you though, who still don't know about National Map. There's some purple history behind that, associated with a brand that will not be named. But last year, after a long period of polite suggestion from a couple of lovely Scottish chaps, National Map officially separated from Critchlow. We removed the purple cloud that surrounded us and embraced a new world where we can now talk confidently to the GIS community about data without any preference for a particular GIS or consulting firm. We're delighted to report that in doing so, we've managed to get national map subscription-based data and the free base maps into ArcGIS Online. And after considering solutions from both Critchlow and Eagle, we've chosen to work with Eagle to produce an HPMV routing solution to combat challenges the heavy transport industry has with understanding their permits and ensuring driver compliance. 
I'm going to tell you about these two initiatives shortly, but firstly I thought I'd give you a couple of facts about little old National Map that might surprise you. There's little doubt that each and every one of you, in fact probably all New Zealanders, on a daily basis are using solutions that are supported by National Map. By capital value, National Map provides data to two of the three largest organisations in the world. And one other of the top five largest organisations in the world through a third party. If you're part of the 55% of New Zealand using Android or 44% using iOS, it is most likely that your last routing experience was supported by National Map. If your car has inbuilt navigation, it is also very likely that your in-vehicle routing has been supported by the team at National Map and the work that they've been doing over a number of years. So why do the globe's largest organisations choose National Map? They tell us it's because of our complete coverage and regular updates, but most importantly, our ability to work with them and be flexible and quickly incorporate their specific needs into their next delivery. Since December last year alone, we've made nearly 68,000 edits to our road network to ensure that it keeps pace with the changes that are going on in the real world. But let's talk about what we've been trying to do to make your lives easier. Well, first of all, we're gonna show you quickly how easy it is for our Esri customers to get access to their data the same way they access all their other data. I know this isn't new for you in terms of how you access your data, but it's part of our commitment to showing you that we're serious about the Esri community. And we understand that you don't necessarily want to leave your ArcGIS online environment to have to download updates and be unsure about whether you've got the latest and most accurate data. Julian has kindly helped us out here by showing in his ArcGIS online environment how easy it is to access the national map data. If you're already a national map customer and want us to turn this feature on for you, please get in touch. The other thing I want to tell you about is our newfound love affair with the Navigator app. We're sick of seeing stories like these in the newspaper and on stuff. And there really is no excuse for it if you're using up-to-date and authoritative road data. So we've joined up with Trish and Julian to create an HPMV routing solution using Navigator and National Map. We're showing you this to demonstrate how National Map and the Esri suite can be combined to get great results. Essentially what our team have done for our two pilot customers is to digitize their HPMV permits. We've loaded these into a map package to be used in Navigator so that drivers can choose their truck and trailer combination, enter their destination, and be routed with turn-by-turn -turn navigation via their HPMV network. The solution works online or offline, as I'm sure many of you would be aware. On the way home, if they're carrying a light load or no load at all, they can be routed via the 50 Max network to ensure that they get home most efficiently while not getting themselves into trouble. With this turn-by-turn -turn navigation, which works even when offline, American companies no longer need to worry about drivers having to understand complex permits or spend considerable amounts of time educating relief drivers that might be new to a route. Well, that's about it for me. So if you're still there, thanks for watching. I'd love to talk to any of you about any data challenges that you might have and how we might be able to help. Those of you who have talked to me before know that I'm pretty big on productivity. So if you're out there trying to create data yourself, at least have a think about what it's costing you in terms of hours and come and talk to us about how cost effective National Map can be for your application. There's a free trial. So if you want to give it a crack, just go to www.nationalmap.co.nz forward slash free dash trial. Hopefully it's on the screen there. We'd love for you to give it a crack and let us know what you think. Thanks again. I hope the conference is proving to be valuable for you. And I'm certainly looking forward to a different experience next year. Thanks, Scott. As Scott mentioned, National Map Data is now available and compatible with the ArcGIS platform. 
Thanks again to the National Map for being part of our virtual NZEUC and sponsoring this, this session. We're now going to dive into our first user story, which is from the Department of Conservation. Doc will be sharing three examples of how they are using the ESRI ArcGIS platform focusing on ArcGIS field operations powered with ArcGIS Online for some of their field work. You will hear about and see examples of tools like ArcGIS Collector, ArcGIS Survey 123, and more, which, which forms part of the capture phase that Ed talked about. But importantly, all phases of the field work are considered through these workflows. So let's hand it over to Matt and Katie from the Department of Conservation to walk us through some of their work. The Department of Conservation has recently refreshed its COPAPA to identify what it stands for and how it sees itself. Papa Tuanuku thrives. The core messages from this COPAPA are we work with others to achieve the gains for New Zealand. We tell the stories of our nature and history, and we are innovative. And from this, we achieve healthy nature, thriving communities, and people who care. Collaboration, storytelling, and innovation. Those three really play into the Esri territory. Today, I want to illustrate three examples of how we are using the technology in the department to aim for these lofty goals. For our first example, we look to the problem of tar in the landscape. There are too many tar in New Zealand, that's the headline, and DOC is mandated to bring those numbers down. Previous reporting on tar control was laborious and paper heavy. GPS units, paper scans, and the redigitizing of them. It was so laborious that we didn't have a robust overview of where tar had been controlled historically. Work done over the past year has led to a collector application that streamlines the data flow and provides field to reporting cohesion. Collector being a map-centric interface is necessary to give the pilot and the spotter certainty they, that they are operating on public rather than private land. The application itself is fairly straightforward. Numbers of tar shot and seen are recorded after every run. The map provides clarity of one's position and is captured as the approximate position of the record. The data flows illustrate the efficiency derived from this application. On the left, the previous methodology of recording audio on the dictaphone or having notes from in a notebook and the subsequent transcription of them left the data open to transcription errors. On the right, data is captured once in the application and this immediately flows through to the reporting end of the chain. An Excel sheet is provided back to the ranger for their own personal reporting requirements. The beauty of this solution is that it puts the technology in the hands of the folk on the ground and brings them along on the digital journey. Users are the best innovators. The centralized application means updating multiple devices is easy and can be done remotely. The hardware used is a Samsung Tablet Active 2, which is ruggedized and is a good size, and runs Android. But most importantly of all, the method captures data once and allows the data to be used many times. For our second example, I'll hand you over to my colleague, Katie Milne, to talk about the helicopter boarding pass. At the Department of Conservation, helicopters play a crucial role across much of our work.
We use them to build and maintain huts and other infrastructure and biodiversity work to manage and monitor native species and widely in animal pests and weed control. As an organisation, it's likely that DOC is the biggest user of helicopters in New Zealand. But while very useful, helicopters pose a significant health and safety risk, mostly because of the high potential consequences if something does go wrong. So as part of DOC's effort to improve safety around helicopters, the helicopter boarding pass was designed early last year as a simple safety checklist to be filled out by the team lead immediately before boarding a helicopter. It aims to slow people down in what can be quite a hectic environment and ensure that critical safety controls are in place. So the survey design is reasonably simple. First, we grab the location. Then we enter the helicopter registration. And then start going through our critical checks. If there's no underslung load, we've completed our check, we get a good to go message. If there is an underslung load, we get a few more checks to complete. If we do answer no or unsure to any of the checks, we get this red message popping up at the bottom and if we try to submit we're prevented from submitting. So we try to make the form as simple as possible as the main purpose of the app is to support the social process of going through these checks with the team and the pilot rather than collecting a detailed data set. And by using Survey123 rather than a paper form DOC has been able to easily update and amend the app in response to feedback and to respond to new risks such as COVID. It's also allowed managers and the health and safety team to monitor usage of the app and ensure safe behaviour is being observed by staff across the country. So this dashboard shows all the boarding passes that have been submitted across the country to date. You can see the pickup in usage in August last year when the app was rolled out and the drop off during lockdown. We can filter the results to look at recent activity and we can zoom into a particular area to look at what activity is happening at a certain location. So overall, feedback from field staff and the health and safety team has been really positive. And having this live view of activity happening across the country has generated wider interest in the technology. Survey123 has proved a user-friendly and agile tool for use in the health and safety space at DOC and further opened the door to other use cases across the department. Our final example really leans on the working with others potential of the platform. We've had experience of cross-agency working before in ArcGIS Online, both through the Carry Dieback program and for the Myrtle Rust response. Our current context post-COVID is the recovery package from the government. The government approved a funding package to DOC of hundreds of millions of dollars to create job opportunities for thousands of people over four years. Measurement is required to report the progress and represent the benefits and outcomes from this funding. 
The DOC funded element is part of a wider cross agency jobs for nature program to the tune of 1.3 billion investment in the New Zealand economy. It is proposed that the DOC develop tool will be able to be utilized by all agencies to ensure consistent and effective reporting in the all of the government space. The two forms are built on survey 123. The people form on the left is a daily report about how many people are on the ground and how much work they are doing and its approximate location. The outputs form is a weekly report looking at capturing the metric of what work has been done, the quantity of the units relate to the project task, hectares of weed control, kilometers of fencing. Further, we want to capture the boundary of the work, as well as any commentary that may be relevant. The forms are designed to be simple, easy to complete and intuitive. One of the hurdles for these forms is the introduction of new technology to external groups. We want them to see the tools as a positive addition to their day-to-day -to -day work. The consequences of not using technology like this is we are left with Excel spreadsheets and emails to manage in a long chain of human interference. The outcome of these forms is that we can have near real time data available to the decision makers and managers on dashboards on their desktops. The forms were quick to stand up and configure to the needs of the project. The capabilities of the platform are perfectly suited to partnership working. And the survey forms stood up in a matter of days have driven conversations across government about their reporting obligations. We are currently working through business pinch points to mandate the mechanism but we are advocating an all of government option for the tools. Our aim at DOC is to underpin reporting with quality spatial data. We believe that we should capture once at source and reuse many times. And we want to deliver innovative tools to help our partners to achieve. DOC has it written into its vision, collaboration, telling stories and innovation. We all believe we can do things smarter than Excel. And the challenge is to convince our leadership that Esri tools can play a part in that journey to ensure that Papatuanuku thrives. Thanks, Matt and Katie. Those are some great examples of how the Department of Conservation are using ArcGIS field operations for their field activities. ArcGIS Collector providing those map-centric workflows, ArcGIS Survey 123, forms-based workflows, coupled with ArcGIS dashboards for capture visualization is allowing DOC to deliver innovative, simple to use tools to help their partners to achieve. Great work from the team at DOC. Our next example comes from Napier Port and will be presented as a customer spotlight. This is a quick fire presentation that will talk about how the port are making use of ArcGIS field operations. To present the work that Napier Port are doing, I'll pass over to my colleague, Ed. Cool, thanks, Jay. This is quite an exciting story um, and it's quite a cool customer um, usage across platform of, of what we have as, as tools and technology, as you saw in the plenary. Um, but Napier Port, they're currently undergoing a multi-year development of a new wharf um, known as Wharf 6. This wharf is a major step up in terms of capacity for the port, including a 50% increase in container capacity, huge for the region. So for this development, the port are dedicated to ensuring that the project is the best that it can be for the area's economy, community and environment. And so as part of this, they are working hard to, the, to ensure that one wee group of residents in particular are kept safe during these works. These are the local population of little blue penguins that nest in and around um, the area. 
So despite being an industrial area, um, the seawalls around Napier Port where they live, the port provides a safe space for penguins as it is free from threats such as dogs, cats and humans. A few years ago, Napier Port undertook its first penguin survey and found around 70 pairs of korora nesting in and around the seawalls at Napier Port. Today, they have around 91 pairs. So to give ongoing protection to the korora, the port have enabled an on-port penguin sanctuary, which has been developed with the help of korora experts from Massey University. So what does this look like? So finding and then safely relocating the penguins is a job for the awesome combination of high tech and man's best friend, with specially trained dogs being used to find the penguins and their nests, and then staff use smartphones loaded with Survey123 to record, map, and track the status of these locations, prior to them being relocated to the new specially built sanctuary. So quite a cool story, um, combining you know, cute, cuddly wee critters with you know, cute and cuddly dogs with an app that's not as cute and cuddly, but very useful. So alongside this, Napier Port are also using ArcGIS Quick Capture in the hands of their staff to monitor the progress of the ongoing construction which is taking place. This information is allowing staff to record any issues or observations with a single button press, and this has immediately been reflected in the operations dashboard. So every time something's caught on the device, it's showing up back in the office on, on a display. So this, in many cases, um, includes um, worksite updates and also supporting photographs. So two really cool little workflows being done in amongst all the, the greatness that Napier Port are currently doing with their um, upgrade. And yeah, just a, a really um, uplifting story of how the tech can be used um, to serve the greater good, no matter big or small. So with that, I'm going to hand you back to Jay. Um, if you're keen on this story, just keep in mind we have a wealth of additional penguin resources for you, um, which can be found on these links here. So we'll keep you posted with how the penguins are doing next year. But for that, I'm going to hand you back to Jay. Back to you. Thanks, Ed. And thanks to the team at Napier Port for sharing their experience and story with us on how they're using ArcGIS field operations for their field work. Our next user story comes from Dwayne Wilkins and Anuru Mills, who worked with the COVID-19 Operational Command Center earlier this year. The COVID-19 OCC is part of the All of Government response to COVID-19. As part of the All of Government response earlier this year, several work streams were established. Dwayne and Anuru will walk us through the work stream they were involved in and how, ESRI mapping and how the ESRI mapping and analytics platform assisted in gathering data and insights and making this available to other agencies. ArcGIS Fear Operations is available on a range of devices and platforms. While predominantly used on phones and tablets, web-centric user workflows are also available from tools like ArcGIS Survey123, ArcGIS Dashboards, and more providing powerful capture and reporting workflows coupled with tools like ArcGIS Hub for dissemination and community engagement. These are just some of the tools that you will see. So let's hand over to Duane and Anuru to walk us through some of their work. Kia ora koutou, ko Duane toko ingoa. I'm from Land Information New Zealand and I am here with... Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, ko Anuru Mill taku ingoa no, no Ngāti Porau. Uh, my name is Anuru Mill. Um, I live in Wellington um, and I work, I work as a consultant, as a contractor, um, but most recently I was um, co-lead of a work stream at the OCC, the Operational Command Centre in Wellington during the uh, level four, three and two lockdowns in um, sort of from March, uh, April through really to the beginning of July uh, 2020. We saw pretty quickly that uh, iwi, Māori and other uh, non-government uh, organisations stood up um, services and responses when other government agencies couldn't um, around the country, but because we had um, most of our public servants either at home or um, you know, confined to um, not being able to get out there in the communities, we had very uh, limited visibility of, um, of what was happening in those communities. So um, for my part, the first thing uh, I uh, thought about was how do, we, how do we gather data on what uh, community organizations are doing, uh, what the um, 
what the government could be doing to respond to the needs of communities um, and what sort of, um, I guess, structures and processes that uh, we could develop on for engagement between government and those community organisations, and particularly um, in our case, in our work stream uh, with iwi, Māori and Pacific uh, non-government organisations. Um, so on the government side, we set up a, um, established a, uh, a table, and when I say we, um, the chief executives of uh, Te Arawhiti, the Māori Crown, um, uh, Māori Crown Relationship Agency, and Te Puni Kōkiri, the Ministry for Māori Development, um, convened by the two chief executives of those organisations, Dave Samuel and, and Lillian Anderson, uh, to engage with the Iwi Chairs Forum, um, who had reached, the forum has reached right across the country with about 60, 65 iwi. Um, mostly meeting by YouTube on a daily basis uh, with a group of um, Māori DCEs uh, convened by the, by the two agencies. Um, the ICF group was led by Iwi Chairs Forum COVID-19 group was led by uh, Mike Smith. Uh, Mike and his um, the other members of that group, which included Debbie Packer um, and uh, various technical um, health people from their advisory people from their from the ICF, um, brought to the table on a daily basis to this group of Māori DCEs all of the issues that their constituent iwi were um, encountering throughout the country. Um, so you can imagine it was everything from, you know, um, access to PPE, uh, food supply, um, testing, um, understanding where the testing centres were for Māori and, and, and a range of communities. Uh, and we were having to process um, these issues. Um, so received in a, in a, a table or a spreadsheet on a daily basis, and the objective would be before we met the next day, the Māori DCEs with the ICF group, uh, we would have to uh, formulate our responses, our, our cross-government, coordinated cross-government responses. So there was the data system requirement to look at, try to get insights as to what was going on around the country in these communities, and there was a, it was sort of like a, a, a data system requirement to, um, understand the issues and needs being uh, raised on a daily basis by the ICF group. So um, pretty early on, um, with the help of, um, and I had a team of secondees, um, Fai Tibble from uh, SWA, the Social Wellbeing Agency, and um, we, pr we pretty quickly, we locked on to uh, Dwayne Wilkins from Linz, who is, uh, who is GIS uh, specialist, as you probably know. Um, and we, um, we formulated this plan to uh, build a GIS system um, to collect the issues, uh, map the issues, and um, provide uh, portals to the various stakeholders on the government side and on the community side so that everybody, was, everybody could see the information as we were receiving it and as we were responding to it. So Manaki was born on that basis. Um, we dreamed it up, I guess, or thought about it, or designed it in mm, a few days, and um, probably just over a week, um, the first version of Monarchy was built. Um, and the basic proposition was that we would take all of the, or we'll take as many of the um, data sets that were being generated by government agencies in the OCC, in the Operational Command Centre. So that was police, health, MSD, where we could, um, everything that TPK had. Um, so a really wide range, um, Ministry of Education, a really wide range of data sets. Um, and uh, Dwayne would, um, would map them. Um, we, had a, a, we had another, I guess another uh, dev guy who was helped to maintain the administrative side of the system. That was um, Hurricane Hunia. And Hurricane was based in Takatane. Uh, he runs a little, little com dev company called Kotaku Systems. Um, and then we had some analysts uh, that were seconded to them. We, we ended up calling it the Manaki team from uh, Te Arawhiti and from Te Puni Kōkiri. So these were policy analysts. Um, 
and uh, they helped us to support, they helped to support the administrative side and the sort of, I guess, analytical insights side of, of Manaki. Um, the basic proposition was uh, we would provide all the government data sets that were made available to us from the OCC um, to, uh, we would map them into Manaki. Uh, we would invite uh, community organisations to register with Manaki. We would provide them um, a portal to see all of the, those government data sets. And then um, we would also uh, allow them to enter their own data through a, a basic survey form that um, really us, Fai and, um, and Dwayne designed and built uh, right at the start. And we, we um, incrementally, incrementally improved that along the way. Um, so there were basic questions about, you know, so is this an issue or an activity? Um, what is the priority of this issue or activity? Um, what domain does it sort of connect with? And we were thinking about well-being domains. Um, if you needed a response from, uh, from government or from a particular agency or group of agencies, you know, what could that look like? Um, and so uh, NGOs, um, Iwi Māori and other NGOs were able to um, uh, and, and put that sort of data, we were monitoring it, and we would take um, that information uh, to the um, Māori DCEs group, the Māori uh, Deputy Secretaries group, who could go back to their own agencies and respond to that. Basically, they were decision makers, um, and they could make decisions um, almost in real time after seeing those issues recorded in real time. So that's basically the Manaki system. Kia ora anadu. Dwayne here, uh, just going to step you through the Manaki website and also the core parts of the system. So if you want to have a look at uh, manakipromise.co.nz at any time, this is an AGOL based hub site and Hurricane developed this, um, which is pretty easy to do. It's what you see is what you get. Um, we set up the domain name with it. Um, it's a nice uh, WYSIWYG type builder. Uh, you can have a look at the maps and data. And if you want to register, if you're a community group, here's where to register, set the terms and conditions and the login uh, will take you through to the site. And this is our logged in viewer. This uh, Manaki data entry form is the, the kind of the linchpin of the whole system. And the setting in there that enabled it is that uh, logged in editors can only see their own data and they can only edit their own data. So uh, no system user can see anyone else's data, um, just their own. And we can also roll that through into custom maps as well. Um, so Ryan set up some pretty neat uh, custom functions in here. For example, um, this started off life as a risk assessment but turned into a seriousness uh, label. It's just to help uh, identify uh, the perception of that issue that someone might be entering. And also here we didn't want to capture personally identifiable information so being a community level uh, pro work program we wanted to sort of uh, enable capturing of information for uh, people that may not have ever used map tools before um, but um, not needing to enter an address. So we're capturing latitude, longitude here. Um, we also provided very simple tools for people to edit their own data and view it on a map as well. And you'll see this test record here. Um, Ryan Cooper very kindly figured out how to embed the, or the, um, the data entry form so that um, it, individual groups can edit uh, any records that they've entered and update them as well. It's the only system I know of where you've got the same level user level of access between government officials, which are us that we're working on the project, and the community groups who are using the, the tool. So there were no other sort of secret or hidden data sets, which was awesome. Um, the deprivation uh, explorer, uh, sorry, de can we, uh, start again. The Neighbourhood Demographics Explorer, which is focused on uh, deprivation, which is uh, from uh, based on the census, which was just released uh, just as COVID was coming out, uh, the lockdown was starting. Uh, so 
Eagle re-hosted the data from stats and made it easy to consume and as, as a web service. So we could focus on using the data and, and responding to our users needs rather than having to spend um, a lot of time trying to figure out how to do joins and renaming field headings and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so this has been a very, very popular um, viewer. And I know stats have now uh, deployed their own um, census uh, Based viewer as well. And this is using the, the dashboard beta, uh, so it's a pretty neat tool. Um, we also had some support from Stu Smith from Housing and Urban Development, as well as um, Beth Lawson who from Linz, who built this uh, proportional demographic data viewer. Uh, so usually we take uh, you know, the, just the, the values that come, but this is quite neat in that it shows it as a proportion, uh, which is just an alternative way to display that kind of information. The Ministry of Health Facilities Explorer was also very popular. Um, we know there are some issues with the data, but it was better than, than nothing at all. So um, you go to war with the army that you have, not the one you want. And so this data was really um, useful. We got quite a lot of uh, good feedback and use of this um, tool. And of course, um, using the dashboard functionality, you can filter by um, service types and click on an individual location. Uh, and this is data entry, volunteered data entry. So it's all public. Uh, Family Services Director from MSD. Another great data set that was just in text, but uh, once we discovered it, a colleague from Internal Affairs uh, made us aware of this one. And so you can filter out based on um, particular uh, services that you're after, um, whether it's family and whanau or um, childcare or um, family violence, family harm. Um, and clicking on an individual listing here pops up the details which are user submitted over here. So uh, that was a pretty neat um, tool. Uh, Carl Majahazi from uh, Stats, shout out to Carl and also to Stats for supporting his involvement in our uh, program. Uh, he was able to interpret a lot of the data sets that were coming out of the, the Stats uh, census 2018. Um, yeah, I guess you know, when you're in the midst of it, uh, time is very precious. So um, adding value by creating um, viewers that people can readily consume is where we, we saw the value. Um, so it was great not having to uh, manipulate the data, which can take some time, um, as you well know, with uh, trial and error. So yeah, that's the, the main system. Uh, so kia ora. Thanks, Duane and Anaru, for that wonderful insight into some of the work that they were involved in uh, earlier this year with the COVID-19 response. The Monarchy data sharing platform provides an alternative, uh, alternate yet powerful view of ArcGIS field operations. As you saw, they use a lot of the web-centric tools to location enable every phase of the field operation. Duane mentioned that Survey One, ArcGIS Survey One Two Three, underpinned that entire platform, intertwined with ArcGIS Hub for a lot of the dissemination and making data available to others. If you're interested in viewing the Monarchy data sharing platform, it is publicly available for the data that can be made public. It's available on monarchypromise.co.nz. Outstanding work from all that were involved in that project. Our next, um, <clears throat> our next customer spotlight is um, from Capital Kiwi. Capital Kiwi is a not-for-profit organization working to restore Kiwi populations in Wellington. My colleague Ed has been volunteering with them and working with Capital Kiwi on using ArcGIS field operations to assist with this work. So let's hear about how ArcGIS field operations is making a difference to Capital Kiwi. Ed. Cool, thanks Jay. So this was quite an interesting experiment um, and the fact that 
we had two um, very big um, deciding factors which guided what solution we ended up with. The first was the user base. A bunch of guys who have differing um, opinions of technology and how beneficial it can be. Um, we had some real backlash from those who, you know, really do protect their 1B8 exercise book like it's the holy grail. And so bringing technology in was going to always prove to be difficult with um, those individuals. But on the other side of it, we had those who recognised the value in it and were real keen champions as they saw that, it, as Matt said earlier, um, you capture your data once and then you use it in multiple um, different aspects, whether it's an app or a report. So we had the people, but then also we had the technology. With the field apps, they've been moving so fast that we've gone very quickly from collected a survey one, two, three, um, and now quick capture. And each of those have merits, but really they do introduce three very different ways of capturing information while out in the field. Um, it can either be quite map heavy, it can either be quite form heavy. And so when you've got a, a wide audience of people who are going to be using this tool with differing attitudes towards technology, what is the best fit? Well, in our experience and after many um, tests, we found that Quick Capture actually fitted the bill perfectly. We took the, the effort up front of trying to populate information captured in the field and instead used a post process in order to enrich information. So what I mean by that is when you're maintaining a trap network, it's essentially an asset management problem. You've got a whole lot of assets out in the field that are either um, needing to be serviced, either needing to be checked, or you're getting reports in to say that one of them's been damaged or misplaced. So really, how do we um, encompass all three aspects of, of an asset management um, system for traps into something that's quite easy for the field staff to use? And when we first showed this to the, to the field teams, we, we got um, the description back. It's sort of like a remote control for my traps. I can be pressing a button and it fills out for me the information that I'm required and I can just get on and do my job in the next um, trap along the line. So quite similar to other applications out there, but um, for these guys being able to pick up, you know, press the remote control and capture either kills or um, other things such as when traps need to be replaced and, and how they're faring has been brilliant and a real game changer for how Capital Kiwi um, manage quite a large network. We're talking about 25,000 hectares of um, mixed private um, farmland with, with council um, bush areas and quite vivid coastline all inside quite a, um, an isolated project area. So also that offline capability came in too. Um, you can see the custom base maps that we're able to push in. So as they're dropping a point, they get reference for what trap it was put onto. And all of this forms part of the, the bigger picture. The bigger picture being, you know, quite an impressive um, landscape project funded by Predator Free 2050, um, which you can see borders onto another famous project, Predator Free Miramar. So the whole purpose of this is to try and make the area as free of Kiwi's natural predators as, pro well not natural, but introduce predators as possible. So mustelids um, are definitely on, on the menu here in terms of trying to eradicate them. So we can introduce Kiwi back and um, people can be lying at night and hear their own goodnight Kiwi, um, hopefully a living breathing one rather than something glaring from the tally. And so the data capture from Quick Capture is allowing Capital Kiwi to really get an up-to-date view of the operations daily. As you can see with this um, reporting dashboard, being able to really narrow down on what's happening across the trap line at any point in time from any user, basically because it's a really easy way to capture that information, is something that's been um, quite an exciting experience. So a really simple field mobility story, but sometimes simple is best. So I'm going to hand you back to Jay now, um, who will introduce our next presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Ed, and thanks to the team at Capital Kiwi for sharing their experience and story on how they're using ArcGIS field operations for their work. Now, I just want to remind everyone that we are getting a few questions through, so I do encourage you to please keep sending through those questions, ask those questions, and, and hopefully we'll have enough time to, uh, to address a few of them. <clears throat> Our last user story today comes from Maritime New Zealand and the MPRS team. This is the Maritime Pollution Response Service. The MPRS team may be using ArcGIS field operations for many of their field activities. And Mike from MPRS has created a video for us to walk through some of their work. Now, before we play this video, I do want to really thank Mike and the MPRS team for their efforts in making this video. Mike is based up in Auckland and um, he put this 
he put this video together last week, um, obviously with the ongoing COVID-19 situation. Um, he managed to create this during lockdown on his mobile. So um, great effort from him and great effort uh, to the team at Marit Maritime. So thanks in advance. But let's have a look at um, what they're doing with ArcGIS field operations. Over to you, Mike. Tato, my name's Mike McMurtry and welcome along to the ISRA User Conference. I'm from MPRS, which is the Marine Pollution Response Service, and we're part of Maritime New Zealand. Uh, in Maritime New Zealand, we've got a couple of roles. One is in peacetime, we're busy doing some planning. We're looking after oil transfer sites, checking out the offshore oil and gas guys, et cetera, et cetera. We're also doing some training, doing some exercising, building capability for our national response team or our NRT. We set up in exactly the same way as uh, many of you who are watching this will be uh, under the SIM structure. And today we're just going to focus on the intelligence function who are there to, as we know, collect some information, turn it into intelligence, and then disseminate that information to provide situational awareness to the response. So uh, today we've talked about uh, who we are, great. We're going to talk a little bit about what our information needs are, and then thirdly, how ESRI and the ESRI suite has helped us to uh, fulfill those needs. Back soon. Kia ora, welcome back. So we know that for every response, we need good information that we can turn into good intelligence that will fulfill the, uh, the action plan that then leads to on the spot operations. For us, we've got uh, five key questions and those key questions are, if I pan a little bit this way, um, what happened? as in to cause an oil spill. Where is it? So currently, where is the spill? Where's it going? Bit of trajectory modeling, and then what's in the way, and what can we do about it? Those are our five key points. For the first three, we're gonna get that information from the vessel master, or potentially some uh, synthetic aperture radar information, or some aerial observations and trajectory modeling. It's this one here, what's in the way? That's the key one for the topic of today, which is all to do with our data collection apps that we're using in the field and how we're going to present those in the ECC or the Emergency Coordination Centre to ensure that everybody's informed about what we've found out in the field. So the last explanation on our information requirements is right here on board. This is a very high tech approach for such a high tech audience. Um, our information requirements, we want information on a whole suite of things. Health and safety, of course, we want to know what the risks are for our teams who are going out to respond to an oil spill. We want to understand what the weather and ocean data uh, tells us. We want to source information from Iwi and Hapu around cultural sites, uh, and especially no-go areas or um, tapu areas. We're obviously interested in what's going on with the shoreline, both pre-impact and also after the oil has impacted the area. We want to know the shoreline type, how much debris there is on the, uh, on the shoreline and whether access is probable or possible or viable or feasible. Um, that's going to feed into our operations aspects. We're really keen to understand what the sensitivities are. And a lot of this we can get from other places, but we uh, need to know the economic, the commercial, the environmental uh, sensitivities, especially things like estuaries and mangroves. And we also want to know what's going on with the wildlife. The applications that we have um, developed with the help of Eagle Technologies are firstly the shoreline assessment application for our shoreline assessors who will be going out and collecting that info. Uh, our wildlife reconnaissance application which also has a bolt on for wildlife collection. And then we have our public data submissions application. So uh, that allows us to source information from the public via an embedded web app. So they can tell us whether they see oil, wildlife or debris. All of this feeds into a pot, and of course we want to display it in the ECC, so uh, we also have, thanks to our team at uh, Eagle Tech, uh, who've been working with us closely, uh, built a Intel and planning dashboard, so, um, so we can display all this information in pretty, well, pretty much real time, which is a real bonus for us. Back in a minute. No my hokey my, welcome back. Um, so there's a desperate times alert level three. So uh, you thought the whiteboard was low tech, wait till you see my applications. Um, as we said, all of our systems have been stitched together using workforce. So we can then jog off and task our national response team members to go and undertake some surveys. The surveys as uh, suggested before, maybe the wildlife recon could be the shoreline assessment. 
and of course uh, we have our public reporting application there as well for the public. That'll go up on the MNZ website when there's an incident. So of course, once our uh, once our folks are being tasked, they'll get their uh, they'll get their assignment, which is to jog off down the beach and do uh, a survey, whether it's a shoreline survey or a wildlife survey. And we cut to the first of the applications now. So this is the shoreline assessment application. Um, as you can see, some real basic stuff: uh, name, date, and time. Um, how the survey was day, uh, undertaken. The surveyed section, we'll see a little bit of a snip on the next um, print. And then whether we've got stranded oil in the intertidal or the supratidal, which is kind of further up on the dunes uh, or up on the uh, up on the land side there, less likely to get remobilized on the next tidal cycle. We're also interested in access information. So whether our folks can get down there to do some cleanup, uh, obviously health and, safety, uh, health and safety info and staging info. Where can we go and set up? Uh, platforms for equipment staging. Finally, have we started any wildlife? Yes, that gives us a prompt to go and talk to our wildlife folks so that they can do their wildlife reconnaissance in a more structured manner. Here's, um, here's a section here where this might be the section that was surveyed and then we can add additional areas on the map where we've seen intertidal oil or supratidal oil. The, we want to collect some information also around the uh, around the oil itself. You know, how thick was it? Was it just a cover or a coat, etc.? And then percent cover. Was it just a smattering on the uh, on the coast, or was it heavily heavily coated with not much of the substrate firing on or poking on through there? So it's pretty simple stuff that we're getting from the shoreline assessment crew. So if our wildlife folks have been tasked to go out and do some reconnaissance, then they're going to get an application that looks a lot like this piece of paper. Um, again, date, time, who was it, uh, what type of survey was undertaken, was it by on foot or by boat? Um, some information on the surveyed section, so give us some geospatial information there. And whether any wildlife was sighted, uh, how was access, and are there any staging spots? If there were some wildlife sightings, then uh, the wonderful survey one, two, three gives us some additional options. Uh, what kind of critter was it? Give it a name. Um, from the alive ones, how many were oiled, how many were non-oiled, and from those who had deceased, how many oiled and non-oiled. And of course, a range of photos. If there's some collection taking place, then goes to the next section of the application, just again to capture uh, capture information on uh, alive, uh, oiled and non-oiled, and deceased, oiled and non-oiled. Again, more photos and again, some more access information. So nothing really uh, over the top there or super complex by a long shot. For the public, the public get to dial onto the MNZ site once an incident page has been put up and there'll be a link to this web form and they can either report oil or wildlife or debris. Give us a location, fantastic stuff, fire in some photos, and then provide some contact details and some comments. Uh, again, not groundbreaking, which is great. Nice and simple, we like simple. It's a little level three, so uh, apologies for the, uh, the lack of, kind of digital uh, wizardry here, but um, here is a snapshot of our dashboard. Again, for the extent that the map is zoomed to, uh, we'll see we've got some information smattered around the place. This will be tallied up into some metrics up the top here. How much heavy oiling have we got? How much very light oiling have we got? Both in the intertidal and the supertidal. Uh, we also get a little bit of a tally of public reports, 15 oil reports, four debris and eight wildlife, uh, media that's associated with the reports and wildlife that has been uh, either sighted or collected. So pretty handy stuff for us to use in the ECC in real time. That's pretty much a wrap from us. Um, a very simple case study by MPRS uh, slash MNZ. Um, thanks again to Eagle for having us here and to share what we've done. Uh, we're really happy with the tools. For us, they give us a very simple and very effective way of collecting information um, on a very robust platform that can be then immediately viewed and analysed in the ECC.
uh, for us that suits our needs down to the ground. For future developments, we may well look at um, integrating some of the synthetic aperture radar information, um, our oil spill trajectory modeling information as well, bringing that into GIS. Um, maybe a, a national stock take of what data holdings are around the nation and how we can get those into GIS for all the environmental and uh, wildlife information that's out there. So there's plenty of work to do, um, but we're really happy with how this project has worked out. Thanks again. Kia ora. Thanks, Mike. How cool was that? Especially the paper-based apps. The MPRS team are making use of a wide range of tools uh, from ArcGIS Build Operations. ArcGIS Workforce for the tasking and work order assignment, ArcGIS Survey 1 to 3 and Collector for capture, ArcGIS Dashboards for reporting, and the web tools for public information. Again, a very big thank you to the Maritime New Zealand and the MPRS team for the effort in creating this video to share their work with you, even though we're in this really testing times with COVID-19. So uh, thanks. Thanks, team. Our last customer spotlight covers some of the field work uh, as field operations work that the Bay of Plenty and Greater Wellington Regional Councils have been doing. Um, and back to present this work, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Ed. Cool. Cheers, Jay. So yeah, the reason why we bundled these two presentations together is um, they, they were both received in across our desk and they had a common theme of um, pest plant eradication and control. And so we thought it'd be brilliant to showcase sort of two different approaches that have been done to combat this issue and some really interesting takeaways from these. So we'll start first with the Bay of Plenty Regional Council. So Ethos Environmental and the Bay of Plenty Regional Council are collaborating to create a system to record, analyse and report invasive pest plant data across the entire region. For those who know the Bay of Plenty, you'll know that this is a, a pretty daunting task with some of the terrain in there. The system covers over 100 species, 250,000 landowners and a million hectares. The many uses include council staff, contractors and those from other agencies who will be using the full suite of tools in ArcGIS Online and a few custom made ones to collaborate on this ambitious project. And so spearheading this is a familiar face to a lot of those who have been to the conference in the past, Scott Sample and Millie. So really having these guys involved on the team, sort of this partnership, has created quite a few useful applications to really store information and use it across many different applications um, to all um, go towards that common goal of trying to get rid of these pest plant species. So yeah, just to reiterate, you know, big values of um, species, landowners, and project area size for this one. So the first thing we have here is, you know, replacing that desktop data entry um, outside of the platform with a configured tool built inside the platform to assist with actually entering in information um, around where um, each of these properties inside the project area and how they are tracking. The next one is to show infestations from a location angle. And you can see, you know, using clever symbology alongside um, key indicators and statistics actually creates quite a compelling visual for understanding infestation from a location, but also a um, traditional numeric and, and list-based angle. So it's really neat um, methods here. Then looking at um, plant surveillance areas, using Tracker and the data that it creates and bringing it into a dashboard really does give you that complete picture of how um, monitoring can be done and seen and, and understood. Because usually when we hear about someone going out to an area to do something, we don't necessarily see exactly what they've done inside that area. It's more just thinking of it as a binary. It's either been covered or it hasn't. Or well, here we see almost a percentage value of what's been searched um, in each of these areas that have been assigned, looking out for where these pest species are. And knowing Scott Sample, um, there's always you know, more to dashboard than you ever would have thought. And this is one of the dashboards here just showing um, a lot of the properties across the project area and the status of them in terms of how they're faring from um, whether they've got a concentration of pest plants and whether they're awaiting to be inspected or whether they, they haven't been contacted yet. So really it's, it's that digital twin, if you like, of what's happening out there on the ground replicated inside the software. So decision makers and those on the ground can all understand how they're um, tracking 
in terms of how they're going to achieve this quite audacious goal. But we've got full confidence seeing um, the tools that they've set up in order to complete this, this job. So that's one look um, up in the Bay of Plenty. The next look is um, at Greater Wellington Regional Council and I'd like to um, thank Jeff Lewis for being able to share some of um, his story with us to present on his behalf. So biosecurity pest plant users with low ArcGIS skills wanted to access consistent up-to-date data about any locks, sometimes offline, and be able to report complex variations of data with minimal upskilling in, in systems, for example. And they wanted all of this to be automated um, to transfer data overnight to different databases around um, this project. So to satisfy these customer requirements, a system was created using ArcGIS Desktop, Model Builder, distributed geodatabases with domains and defaults, ArcGIS Online web apps, maps and services. They also utilised a lot of the field tools we've been discussing today, such as Collector, Survey123, and other traditional tools as well. Um, an SDE database held together by Python 3 scheduled tasks to run overnight to make sure the data was in the right place at the right time. So some of the key things here um, to really appreciate this project is this was designed to be a simple offline uh, method of accessing data and editing it. It needed to be standardised um, to allow for centralised data storage. And what it was aiming to focus on was regional pest management plan data availability. Um, the objective was made possible, and as a result, um, you'll see some of the dissemination products um, that are looking at this field data. And a single dashboard was able to replace 50 to 70 individual report graphs and statistics, which would have had to be calculated manually. So really, the, the efficiency isn't just in the capture of the data out in the field, it's in the efficiency of being able to understand and visualize and report on it using um, that same suite with things like dashboards. So just as a few examples um, of how collaborative this project was, you'll see little paw prints um, on, on each of the property parcels. This is actually dog, um, dangerous dog data from wired up TLAs that was supplied externally um, into the project, really allowing for worker safety as they're going in and inspecting for pest plants in order to manage them. So being able to combine Collector and Survey123 in these workflows, you know, allows both accurate data capture, but at the same time that situational awareness for worker teams, you know, recognising that there's a dog on the property before realising it's a little too late. So this wasn't just in the field tools, this was also um, back in the, in the web tools. So even if you went out, um, you'd be able to recognise if someone was doing a piece of work in a certain area, um, actually being able to have that shared situational awareness of where these dogs and the properties were. So quite a, an inventive way, I think, of bringing in a whole lot of data from different sources to help make your operations not just more efficient, but safer as well. So start thinking about what different um, data sets perhaps out in, in your neck of the woods might be um, integral to ensuring your worker safety that another organisation could provide. And now, um, I guess the piece to the resistance of all of us is the, the final dashboard. And what they found was operations dashboard was a little too limited for all the variations of reporting that were required, given that you've got 50 to 70 different graphs that they're trying to replace with a digital based um, solution. And so a custom dashboard using Web App Builder's dashboard template was created to showcase a lot of this data that was um, being captured out in the field. So this is a web app using dashboard widgets and filters that reports the annual RPMP um, site inspections and delimiting survey results. So being able to use this tool rather than having to download the data, put it into a separate tool, and then manually create these statistics each year is something that the, the platform's been able to provide. So once again, thanks to Jeff for allowing us to spotlight on um, a bit of your work. And I'm going to hand you back to Jay now, but it's been a pleasure being able to showcase these little customer stories um, in between um, the larger presentations. So I'll hand it back over to Jay. Awesome. Thanks, Ed. And again, thanks to the team at Bear Plenty and Greater Wellington Regional Councils for uh, allowing us to share their experience and their story uh, around how they're using ArcGIS field operations uh, for their work. So we've only got a few minutes left, and um, I want to I want to cover off a, a bit of a wrap up and and really what's next. Uh, we've heard some great user stories today that are making a huge difference. 
Um, so we often get this question of how do you enable ArcGIS field operations? Um, so I want to quickly run, and, and many of you will be aware of this, but I want to quickly run you through just how you can enable ArcGIS field operations. So some of you might know this, but for those that don't, the ArcGIS platform is licensed based on user types. This is available on ArcGIS Online, our SaaS platform, and ArcGIS Enterprise, our on-premise or public private cloud platform. ArcGIS field operations capability is available across all these different user types. If we start on the left, we get our viewers um, being able to view and query content online or offline. Um, next up with the editors, including access to web-based editing tools. While well, we have a specific user type now, which includes access to the majority of ArcGIS field operations capabilities. This includes apps like Workforce, Collector, Server123, Quick Capture. And for those interested in the, in the, in the more premium field operations apps, uh, apps like ArcGIS Navigator, allowing you to route your, uh, to, to your work, and you saw examples of that uh, today uh, offline, or even ArcGIS Tracker, which allows you to know where your workers are and see progress of them in real time. These are available as add-ons um, to the above user type. So Ed has walked us through uh, ArcGIS field operations earlier and the wide range of apps that are available through each phase of those field works. Focused apps for each activity. So what's next? Well, Sa uh, Sam covered ArcGIS field maps, um, which, is, which, which is coming very soon. But I just wanted to give you guys a, a very quick background on what this means. We, we started building ArcGIS Collector back in 2014 and it became the foundation of ArcGIS field operations. As more customers began adopting field apps in their organizations, we started adding more capabilities. And we followed a pattern by building focused applications for each activity or capability. And the apps you see here uh, are all built from the ArcGIS Runtime Software Development Kit and are, and are effectively the foundation of ArcGIS field operations. And there are several specialized apps, apps like Server123, Credit Capture, et cetera. However, with all these apps, the feedback that we've had from organizations is that they found deploying multiple apps to complete workflows was too cumbersome. It required downloading of each app, signing into each app, linking them together, and in some instances, downloading copies of data multiple times. So with each of these core apps, we're now going to be consolidating them to the, into one app that can be used to complete each activity. For those I mentioned attended the plenary this morning and the road ahead session, you would have heard Sam talk about the latest app that's coming, um, ArcGIS Field Maps. This, is, this, is, uh, this was launched last month and is available currently right now in beta. It's Esri's new premier maps app and available on iOS and Android devices. It's gonna combine the, a number of capabilities into a single app that is easy to use and easy to deploy. Simple map viewing and markup, ArcGIS Explorer's capabilities. High accuracy field data collection and inspection, ArcGIS Collector's capabilities. Battery optimized location tracking, ArcGIS Tracker. Work planning and task management, ArcGIS Workforce. Turn by turn navigation, ArcGIS Navigator. As Sam mentioned this morning as well, uh, Field Maps app will also include a new web application integrated into with ArcGIS, they can be used to configure, deploy, and optimize your maps for the web, mo mobile workforce needs, creating and assigning tasks to mobile workers. Now, these capabilities are going to be introduced over phases, and we're going to, but the key thing is we are going to continue to grow and maintain our specialized apps like Survey123 and Quick Capture. Bringing these foundational apps together, we will provide a single app for exploring maps, high data accuracy collection, location tracking, and workforce and navigation. Um, Sam touched on the phases earlier as well. Phase one, focusing on the, on, on, on the premier app for mobile devices. Phase two, workforce coordination. And phase three, turn by turn. Now, I encourage you to visit the link that I've provided down the bottom on this slide for, the de for detailed information on ArcGIS field maps, including how you can access the beta, which is available right now. Phase one of ArcGIS field maps is planned for September 2020. So now that's next month. So this is a great opportunity for you to start using field maps um, start getting used to the uh, tools, start testing it with some of your existing workflows. Going a little bit wider, what else are we working on? Now, I just wanted to give you a very high level view on some of the key areas that we're working on for, uh, for, from a field operations perspective. One of those things is providing consistency of experience across all of our applications. And we've already started to do that with ArcGIS Field Maps app. We wanna, we wanna bring offline mode capability to all of the applications and an improved sign-in experience. We want to enable ArcGIS Smart Forms across all of the applications. ArcGIS Smart Forms is effectively the capability that you saw or that you use within Survey123, but now 
that will be available within ArcGIS field maps, as well as wide, the wider applications. Making field operations easier to set up and manage and making data integration with live information a possibility. We're looking at bringing in live traffic information, live weather information. But I encourage you to please post your ideas on ideas.arcgis.com as we want to hear what you want to do and what would you like to be included with ArcGIS field operations. So for the last part of the session, we'll look to answer some of the questions that, that have come through. As mentioned, we have not had, um, we might not have all the time. I think we've got a few questions that have come through, Ed. Is that right? Yeah, correct. So there, there, are, um, there are a couple questions which have come through. And just bear with me. I'll just try and bring that up. There we go. So uh, as I mentioned, um, we, we obviously can't answer all of the questions because we've only got a few minutes left and you know, it's, it's, it's nearly on to quarter past five. So uh, obviously want to let you guys go. Uh, but just to address two questions that have come up, which I think are, are, are quite important. Uh, one of those questions was, we heard about ArcGIS mission in the plenary this morning. Where does this fit into ArcGIS field operations? Ed, do you want to give us an answer to that? Yeah, sure. So ArcGIS mission is a, is a capability quite different to what we've seen with other field apps. Um, if we were to compare it to anything that exists currently, it's probably workforce. Thinking about how we've got this dispatcher view um, and field worker view um, working um, together in the same application. So ArcGIS mission is all about the communication and um, the quickness and rapidness of that between those in the field, who they're working with out there, and those back in the office. So in terms of where it fits into field operations, it's more of a communication and situational awareness tool. Um, it doesn't replace the data capture um, workflows um, that currently exist in the platform. Um, in fact, it's more marking up on a map rather than capturing um, quality geospatial information. But the principles remain. The information that it captures, um, either through the chat log, uh, the markup on the map, it can all be reused elsewhere in the platform, but it won't replace um, what's already out there to capture quality um, geographic information on things that you care about. But it's definitely a capability for those who need that enhanced tactical solution um, to really communicate between each other. So hopefully that um, answers that question. Back to you, Jay. Thanks, Ed. Uh, another question that we've had um, is I have, I have several projects that I have been building um, with an ArcGIS collector. What happens to these when I start using ArcGIS field maps? Ed? Yeah, so as you've seen in the plenary with Sam, um, ArcGIS field maps looks the closest in the Esri ecosystem to collector. And we've been doing a bit of testing already at Eagle because we're aware that a lot of you have invested a lot of time into collector-based projects. And really with ArcGIS field maps coming along quite quickly, um, it can come as a bit of a surprise or a shock that we're going to have to start thinking about how to migrate these. Well, the good news is we're finding already when we open up ArcGIS field maps, we're finding that our collector projects are automatically coming through um, and, and we can use and interact with them like we would with a collector project. Um, as Jay spoke about and as Sam has spoken about, really what ArcGIS field maps is trying to do up front is replace um, Explorer and Collector primarily and combine them into one app. So the thing about ArcGIS field maps is um, fit for purpose for a lot of your collector work and workers will also get the ability to do map-based markup on top of it, something that you can't currently do in collector. So keep working away on your collector projects. It's awesome to see your, your usage and don't see ArcGIS field maps as a big scary thing. Actually, it, it's your friend. It will easily consume what you have. Um, hopefully that answers that one. Back to you. Thanks, Ed. <clears throat> and thanks to everyone. Um, yeah, look, I mean, we, we have, um, well, we're actually bang on time. So I know there's a few other questions that are coming through. What we'll do is we will uh, please be assured that all the, please be assured that all the questions will receive a response um, and we will be posting a, a follow-up. So I do encourage you to please ask as many questions as possible. As an alternative, I'm keen to, I'm keen to keep the conversation going. Um, and we're always available to answer your questions. We posted our email addresses, so please don't spam us, but uh, feel free to email us if you've got any questions. Lastly, I just want to say a very big thank you to you, uh, to all of our presenters and our sponsor, National Map, uh, for attending the session. Big thanks to Ed as well for his involvement. <laughs>
Um, remember the NZEUC virtual platform will be live for two weeks from today. The recordings, as I understand, will be available uh, tomorrow. You can continue to ask questions during these two weeks and our team will be there to answer, answer them in a timely manner. Alternatively, as I mentioned, feel free to, uh, to, to email us uh, as well. Um, like I, I also mentioned, there were some questions that came through that um, we weren't obviously able to address live and some of those related to um, some of the other presenters today. So uh, we will post them in the session um, as well. If you are using the notes, if you did use the notes functionality to take some notes, please remember to send these to yourself. So again, thank you very much for attending our session. I hope you found it useful. Please give us some feedback. Uh, but I think from both Ed and, our, Ed and myself, we really look forward to uh, seeing you all face-to-face -face sometime soon. So take care and um, we'll see you soon. Cheers.